All right, now there's been a discussion here. Um, I've been saying PDM. Maybe it's because I've, I've been looking at too many PDFs on my computer. But you're the experts. I think terminology is important because people are going to hear about what they hear about and they need to recognize it for what it is. So PDN is not what you would call it. Well, in, in certain cases, it's, it, I like to define it as diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Now, whether it's painful or not is the question because about 50% of the time, these are not painful. Um, and you may actually have a uh, dysthesia or a paresthesia with it. Um, so when I look at treating it from, uh, with an anal from an analgesic standpoint, then it's painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Um, so that may be where the disconnect comes. PDPN. Right. Pain now, do you guys call it something else? Do I agree, agree on a term? That's pretty much what I call it. Painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Yeah, you know, in general they call it diabetic peripheral neuropathy or DPN, but right. like Joe says, when it becomes painful, we add the P in front for the... I mean, the where, where I work and where I trained, um, diabetic peripheral neuropathy is usually uh, anesthetic. In other words, that's why we see all the, the peripheral ulcers and things where they get, they get injured because they can't feel. This is, this is distinct from that, right? All right, well, describe to me then some of the effects of untreated uh, peripheral painful diabetic neuropathy on patient's quality of life, Joe. Right, well quality of life, I think you just sort of mentioned it. What happens, think about this, in the middle of the night, a patient wants to get up to go to the bathroom and the lights are off and you can't feel you know, when you lose your proprioception or decreased tactile stimulation and you bump into something and you don't realize that you just cut your toe open, um, think of how that manifests itself. So, or if the bath water is too warm and you put your feet into it and you don't know that. So there are some real issues related to quality of life that, uh, and functionality. So I think it's a, it, it's a combination of quality of life and how their functionality is greatly impaired. Uh, for these patients. You know, it would be great if patients never got this in the first place or deferred the onset of this. Um, is there something patients can do uh, on their own or with the help of their physician to, to mitigate against the early development of this? I would just suggest control your diabetes well. At good, tight control of diabetes, take care of your limbs, and um, I think a vascular evaluation is also in order to make sure that, that there's good perfusion to the distal extremity. Um, but I think diabetic control is what it comes down to. So take your meds, take them right. Good, Watch your diet. good glycemic control is extremely important, and then I think you know we also I think would agree that, as Christopher said, the cardiovascular system, particularly control of. Uh, lipids uh, and uh, blood pressure, et cetera, is extremely important in these patients. All right. You know, I'll, I'll just add real quick that I've been counseling my patients from a nutritional standpoint. Right? So think about that. A guy who's trained in pain is now talking to his patients about diet. And there are certainly certain foods, particularly in the diabetic population, having them on, on a good nutritional regimen that w will maintain tight glycemic control, improve cardiovascular status, and, and improve their condition overall. Well, let me just put the 500-pound gorilla on the table. Do we know? I mean, this all sounds great, right? It's intuitively wonderful. Do you know for sure that tight glycemic control will delay the onset of this? Not at all. I just want to be sure we all agree. I think that, the, that there's evidence that leads us to believe that's true from the neurophysiological standpoint and how uh, this excess sugar in the blood is a binding or, or affecting the nerves themselves. I think the bigger problem is this. We've done a great job at keeping people alive, right? So patients now are living with type 1 or type 2 diabetes a lot longer than they used to. And we can expect that to increase. Uh, here in the United States uh, in 2020, we believe we'll have anywhere between 12 to 16 percent increase in the population over the age of 65. As I mentioned, Christopher and I just came back from Singapore, where in 2040, it's expected to have a, a 359 percent increase in the patient population over the age of 65. So we're doing a better job at keeping these people alive. And this is one of the unfortunate sequelae when they don't have the best glycemic control. So we need to really keep that in mind because as we talk about the point prevalence of pain right now, it's really not where we're sitting, but where we're expanding to. And with older populations, with advances in medical care, with people surviving cancer, let's say, uh, there are other neuropathic conditions like chemotherapy-induced neuropathies, which are, again, in the sort of same wheelhouse. So we really need to, um, for the diabetic patient, 
again, treat them in a multidisciplinary uh, manner. So we're victims of our own success. That's in, in true in a sense. Now, Jeff, walk me through this.